Ah, uh, and here is another daring piece that maybe I won't edit. I'll just record it and go from there. Today, this, tonight, actually, I'm sitting in front of, uh, I think this is, it's not Bitter Lake. Well, I can't remember what lake this is. Um, it's kind of a smallish lake over here in... Uh, Burien, and I don't remember what it's called. Maybe it's Lake Burien. I don't know. In any case, I'm sitting here. It's dark. It's raining. And it's the kind of rain that is, it's not very, it's not raining a lot. It's not like a, a ton of drops, but the drops are so heavy. And it's been this way for a couple of days. Yesterday, we had a hundred percent uh, chance of rain. And today we did too. And it, I'm telling you, they, it, it, they made good on it because, uh, it's been raining and it's just been so such a permeating rain even though it's not a hard rain or even a, a you know a, a completely torrential rain the drops are heavy and they are really soaking into everything including people including me so tonight the piece that i want to record is i'm going to call it uh, what the show's name is this week and that is isosceles and um As most people know, isosceles is a triangle. And so I've been thinking a lot about things like isolates um, and triangulated things. And it's just been kind of in my purview and in my sort of in my day to day um, noticings of things. And it just keeps popping up when I wake up. And so. It's been percolating, and so I think I'll talk about it. I did have another uh, small moment of remembering my grandmother's tamales. And um, she would make them predominantly, especially towards the end, she would make them um, around the time of Christmas or New Year's, you know, the holidays. Uh, before that, she might have made them a couple of times a year or maybe three times a year. But as time went on, and of course, my grandparents got older and a little more frail, um, the things they used to do were were more seldom uh, when they did them again. And they were definitely, it, it took a lot more effort. And so, you know, they were quite a bit slower in accomplishing them, of course, to be understood. But there was always a fight over the tamales. And um, the fight consisted of you know, people putting in kind of an order, like I'm, I'm first and uh, this is how many I want. And uh, they wouldn't dare go to my grandmother or my grandfather over that. What they would do is she's probably going to make these many. And so I think this year, you know, we should get 30 of them. You got, you, you got more last year. You know, we ended up having 20 and you got 30. So it's our turn to have 30 or, you know, there was all this kind of like dickering and, um, going back and forth about, you know, the rights, who had the right to have more, who was going to take more, regardless of what other people said. There was also the argument of who was first in line. Um, sometimes there were years that it went by the age, like, you know, I'm the oldest, and then, you know, it goes down from there. Then, it, then there was just the out and out, bare knuckling it with, I was here first, so too bad for you. When I think of that, it's a, you know, I mean, things got pretty real with that. People were not happy um, if they were left out of the loop. I mean, there, there were times when actual, there were actual moments when people were not going to get anything because they didn't know that the tamale, the great tamale argument and uh, showdown was on, you know, particularly sort of in the beginning of the decline of the tamale making frequency throughout the year. And so there was there was a lot of hard feelings. No kidding, there were hard feelings, and um, everybody uh, was anticipatory of the tamale time. Uh, but as as I said, there was there were people that were actually left out, you know, and not left holding the bag because there was no bag of tamales for them. 
And this was a sore spot. And so as time went on and the arguments and the, you know, the rules of war, uh, the etiquette and um, the ways in which, you know, the, 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 the rules of engagement uh, came in, uh, there was kind of a settling down a little bit, but there was still that fierce competition of, uh, you know, first come, first serve. And, uh, you know, if not that, then I'm going to manipulate and, you know, beat you out of it. I often think about moments like that uh, with my grandparents or with maybe some other people that were, you know, in our family that were kind of making um, things or having a party or something like that. I mean, there were so many things that were happening. I have a huge extended family. And so it just seemed like there was always something going on. And for a while, everybody lived within five or six blocks of each other and lots of cousins. And, you know, I had uh, on my dad's side, I had, um, you know, uh, three uncles and one aunt. So there were five children all together and lots of grandkids. And then eventually, of course, lots of great grandchildren. And on my mother's side, there were seven kids. And so there were six other people other than my mother and lots of kids and lots of, lots of everything. And so the stories are pretty, you know, pretty endless, but the great Tamale war was, I think, uh, as I look at it and I look at other things sort of like that, but I look at that and I think, you know, what, what made this so intense? H how did this get to be such an intense thing? I mean, they're tamales. Are they, you know, I mean, I'm no tamale connoisseur, but are they really the best tamales ever made? And of course, I would never utter that within the table or earshot of anybody that was part of my DNA. But, you know, it just, it, I always wondered, like, is why is there such a huge, you know, run on the bank for these? And when I really think about it, and I think about how much pride my grandmother took in making that, and she took great pride in many other dishes she made, but I think the, the tamales were really something that, you know, she took extra pride in. And, and then I started thinking about that and I thought, you know, what, what was it about that, that she really had this sort of like a little bit of smugness, I'd say, but uh, definitely some pride. And um, what was the other ingredient in there? And it seemed like the other ingredient had to do with some kind of stealth secrecy. And that's because my grandmother never shared the recipe with anyone. You know, we're talking like over 30 cousins on my dad's side and, you know, various relatives. And then, you know, you got 20 or so on my mom's side. And, you know, they're not really part of that whole DNA, but there was never a sharing of the recipe and how to make them. In fact, she would make them alone. Uh, there, you know, there was really, you know, if somebody did help, it was after she'd put all the ingredients together for the masa and, and had everything ready to go so that it was more like a, you know, an assembly line at a Ford plant, you know, where you didn't know the, um, the proprietary uh, ingredients or combinations or um, levels that were included in that. And so this tamale making process, I think she took as much pride in how she kept it a secret as she did in how she made it so delicious. How did she make them so, how she made them so delicious. My grandmother died without anyone ever knowing how to make the tamales. Um, and also, of course, my grandmother died with no one ever getting another tamale, obviously. And I think that what is kind of interesting about that is when I look at the ways in which there is such an emphasis, let's say, on these rules of engagement, on what is, you know, what, what, what do I have the right to do rather than what is the right thing to do? When I look at that there is such, I'd say, maybe even a warped competition instead of a camaraderie and, you know, a way of seeing people as your associates in a sense, at the very least. I'd like to see more of people seeing each other as humans, as human beings, as being not in competition, not in reaction, 
not in a space where we must have some kind of, you know, lipping off that has to happen for everything, whether it is to uh, defend ourselves and what we think we have to defend or whether it's to attack when we have some leverage or counterpoint to do that. I think that when I think about, you know, the isosceles, the triangle, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that these all, these, these as icons at least, or concepts, are all in relation to each other. God's in relation to Jesus Christ. He's his Father, as he is our Father. And the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is there to come into those crannies and those pores that perhaps um, could really use that Holy Spirit coming in that is in relation to our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. I think about that and I think about how well that works and that when we are in a situation that we need to really have some direction, that these are three things, three, three elements that absolutely have our best interests at heart and that these things work in conjunction with each other so that it's not so that, that God can do something, God can do anything. He doesn't, he doesn't need anybody else, but so that we have the availability of that, which is, I would say, assimilable, highly assimilable for us as we are available to it. And also something that is even palatable so that we may take it in and have it be something that helps to inform our movements and the direction of our actions. I think of the tamales and it's a funny story and it's an interesting thing. And I think what's very interesting about it is that through all of the, the sort of arguing and, and play fighting and not so play fighting about who was getting what, there might've been a moment where there was an appeal to pass on that which was so spectacular into the rest of the lineage's time on this planet. But it wasn't really in the cards for that. And I think that somehow in that way, that that, that trifecta of the tamales, my, my grandmother, her children, and her children's children and all of the ways in which these different generations saw the world, that as they were brought together over these tamales, and perhaps, you know, a little bickering over them as well, that some of the true feeling about my grandmother and how she was beloved by us came to light even more so when she was no longer there and no longer making the tamales. This seems to me to be a small, a miniature fulfillment or a miniature mm, representation of that which is the greater, the isosceles, the trifecta, and the Trinity of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That no matter how we act or how we react or what we do, that these are permanent, these are permanent in the eternality of what everything we know and beyond everything we know. That no matter what gets created, no matter what it is that is healed, no matter what it is that we feel is broken, that we are in this keeping, in this, this purview of this isosceles. And there is nothing that we have to fear about what it is that is not, that we don't know, or that we don't have an idea of what it is that we are here to do. As we like to say that we are imperfect, and indeed I think our design is perfect, but that we perhaps execute in an erroneous way at times and think have some erroneous thoughts, that doesn't it make sense that here we are 
in this time, in this lineage, wherein we are a perfect fit because of that which is imperfect or imperfectly executed within the lineage, and that we are the only one that can truly fit and get into that nook or cranny or wherever it is to help bring in the Holy Spirit to heal that lineage, to heal our lineage, and to heal the lineage that will come after us, that is through us and part of us and is eternal as well. I thought about the story of little, um, of Stuart Little today and the fact that in the story, and I remember I just, it, I, it came as a flash today, but I remember reading it when I was very young in grade school. And there was a moment where, you know, Stuart Little, who was as small as a mouse, who's small as a, he was as small as a, is a tiny little, you know, just a regular field mouse. And you never, I, I, well, maybe it became apparent in the story, but I don't remember it being like, why was he kind of that size and shape? And he had human parents. Why did that, how did that happen? And I think he even had a brother and he was normal, but, you know, as a normal sized human person, whatever. But Stuart Little was tiny like a mouse. And there was one part of the story where his, uh, his mother accidentally drops her wedding ring down the drain of the tub. I think maybe she was cleaning it or something. And she took off her ring and then it slipped down the drain. And she was so upset. And he said, just, you know, just send me down there. Just, you know, get a line, get some fishing line or something. I'll go down and I'll find it. I promise. And, and, and she was scared to do that, to put him down the drain because he was so tiny. But it was, it was precisely because he was that tiny. It was precisely because of that, that he was able to do the job that no one else in the family could do. So with a little bit of faith, or maybe a lot, she sent him down, she lowered him down, he found the ring and came back up. And he was, he just felt so victorious. He felt so accomplished because here was something that he could do that no one else in the family could do. And the sort of imperfection of his size or, you know, maybe even, you know, like what he looked like or something like that, like all of that was absolutely the perfect key to bringing back that which represented the love between his mother and father. He brought back the ring and the symbol that it was, and there was, you know, so much joy around that. And I think that, you know, that the example, the story of the tamales was just extraordinary for me to kind of watch and see as the years went on, because it really did represent something that was so completely familiar to our family and completely familiar more so to my uncles and aunts, my aunts and, you know, my cousins that lived there all year round and I only visited here and there. And so this was something that really was a representative of the closeness and the love and the warmth of the family. And when my grandmother went away, when she transcended this life and passed on, and that, you know, of course, that went with her. What was interesting is that now I think about that. And regardless of whether or not there's a tamale in my hand at this point, that also became a symbol of that which was the love of the family. Part of that love represented. And I feel as though I'm kind of like Stuart Little. Because I'm really not like the rest of my family. I'm, you know, I'm kind of a little more odd and you know, just, I don't live there and I don't have the same memories, you know, all together. And so I feel as though that I'm the perfect size and the perfect age. And this is the perfect moment in history for me to be lowered down the drain and bring back this memory as a symbol of what it was to have the warmth and familiarity of my dad's side of the family. That one, one part of it, that one piece of it. And I feel so victorious and I feel very accomplished to do that because within this isosceles of God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit what great joy there is and what great peace there is to know that I'm here doing exactly as I've been outfitted to do 
and I'm doing exactly what it is that will return the symbol in some way to the greater, which is the isosceles of God.